this section we're going to be having a look at the parts of a cell because we want to understand how cells actually operate. And so we're going to start off by saying, listen, cells are very, very efficient and they're an open system. And by an open system we mean that matter can get in and out of cells with the outside world, but that's very carefully controlled as we're going to show you in a bit here. Uh, first off, we're going to have a look at a, at a plant cell. And one of the really distinguishing features of a plant cell is the fact that around plant cells, they have a rather thick cell wall made of cellulose. Animal cells don't have this, but plants do. This is what makes uh, plants crunchy when you chew on them, is this big, thick cell wall. They do have a membrane inside, but it's plastered up against the cell wall, and it'd be very, very hard to see under a microscope, actually. Um, if we continue looking inside the, the cell, of course, we see that it's filled with cytoplasm. That's the fluid inside the cell. But one of the most largest things we notice inside of a plant cell is that they tend to have a very large central vacuole filled with water. And this is what gives the plant cell its water pressure. It's, it's kind of like inflating the bladder inside of a football. When that uh, vacuole is filled with water and has high pressure, the cell is very strong and very rigid, and the plant stands up. Um, the other big thing you'll notice inside of the plant is it has a very large nucleus shown here in purple. If we look inside, uh, we can see other structures. The, the nucleolus is responsible for making uh, ribosomes. And ribosomes are little uh, tiny dots that appear in the diagram here who, whose job it is is to make proteins. There is a membrane around the outside of the, the nucleus called the nuclear envelope. And there are little tiny holes in the walls of the nucleus that allow messages from the nucleus to get out to the, uh, to the, to the cytoplasm. But usually surrounding the nucleus is a whole network of what is called the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And, and sometimes you'll see that called the rough ER for short because endoplasmic reticulum is a pretty big mouthful. It's called rough because the surface is dotted with these little ribosomes that we talked about and we said that ribosomes are, are made by the nucleolus and the job of ribosomes they're like little factories they build molecules they especially are good at building proteins. Um, we have other funny little things in here. Uh, we have the Golgi complex which looks kind of like uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Some kids have described it as kind of looking like a stack of pancakes stuck together. And what the Golgi complex does, uh, well first off it was named after an Italian fellow called Golgi and they named it after him. That was his name. Uh, what this thing does is this is kind of like the shipping department of the cell. It'll take products that the cell makes for export and it'll package them up inside of little vesicles with membranes around them and ship them off outside of the cell for maybe by being used by other cells. There are other kinds of endoplasmic reticulum. There's the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and it's rather like the rough, except it doesn't have ribosomes on it. And so rather than manufacturing things like proteins, it might be used for storage, or it, usually it sends things to the Golgi apparatus to be exported. Uh, plant cells, like animal cells, have mitochondria inside of them. They look like little beans with a folded membrane inside of them. These are the guys who carry out cellular respiration. Cellular respiration. In other words, they're the guys that take uh, oxygen, combine it with uh, glucose, and manufacture CO2, uh, carbon dioxide, and water, basically what you and I do. Uh, the real thing we're grateful for plants, though, is the fact that they have chloroplasts. Uh, this is the green pigment that you see uh, uh, that plants have. It is the chloroplast, which is the organelle inside of a plant cell, that allows a plant to convert sunlight into the food and the oxygen that you and I eventually need as part of the food chain. Um, now all these parts and bits and pieces you're going to have to learn and just memorize and get all sorted out, uh, but you will. Just keep on going over these diagrams again and again. We'll also be contrasting the plant cell with the animal cell. And we're going to see that, for example, there's a lot of things they have in common. If we look at the nucleus again, we see that it has a nucleus, nuclear envelope. The envelope has little holes in it called nuclear pores. Uh, there is a nucleolus in it that's responsible for making the ribosomes. Uh, it also talks about a thing called chromatin, which you can basically think of as the DNA that's inside of the, uh, the organism. Uh, once again, getting out into the cytoplasm, we see that an animal cell has rough endoplasmic reticulum that has all these little dots of uh, ribosomes dotted all over it. Uh, as well, it's also got smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which doesn't have quite as many ribosomes on it. 
We also see that animal cells have a, a mitochondrion, just like uh, plants do. These are the little energy factories that do cellular respiration. Uh, but notice that animal cells do not have a chloroplast. That's strictly the domain of plants. Uh, animals don't have that thing. Something else you'll see in animal cells that plants don't have, they have lysosomes. These contain digestive enzymes that the animal cell will use to break down or digest uh, anything it's trying to eat or digest. Uh, they can also be used to break down the cell after its life is over. Um, they have a cell membrane around their outside, but they don't have a cell wall. Once again, cell walls are something that you're only going to find in plants. Something else that animals have is they have a pair of centrioles. And this is like a bundle of sticks or a bundle of fibers that the animal cell is going to use to help it when it does cell division. And we'll talk about that a lot later in one of your science courses. There is also inside the, the cells a network of microtubules and microfilaments that run through the cytoplasm. And this gives the cell its shape. An animal cell may or may not have a flagellum. So if it's maybe a single-celled pond animal, it, maybe it does. But, uh, for example, the cells in our bodies don't. When we take a closer look at the membrane, we find a pretty complicated structure. And so we'd like to introduce you to the fluid mosaic model of the cell membrane. Now, there's really quite a lot going on. Remember, it's the membrane that separates the cell from the outside world. And so the membrane has a very, very important job of controlling who gets in and who gets out to maintain life inside the cell. The basic unit of the membrane is what's called a phospholipid. And I'll draw one here close up just so you can see what this thing actually looks like. And what it has is, it's a phospholipid. So it has, it has one end up here, which it contains what's called a phosphate. And another one down here. And then it has a lipid. Now, let's understand how this works. Uh, lipids are like oils, for example. And lipids do not like water. You know that oil and water do not mix. And so this region here, made of the lipids, is what's called hydrophobic. Now you know what a phobia is, that's a fear. So this central section of the, of the phospholipid complex doesn't like water. It repels water and that's why these two ends join because these outside ends are hydrophilic. And what that means is they like water. So these naturally organize themselves with one end facing outwards because it likes water and the other ends tucking themselves inwards because they don't like water and they hold together like this and you end up with this entire, it's almost like a mattress of these, uh, this phospholipid membrane. But there's a lot more to it. You'll notice, for example, that embedded in this membrane are all sorts of interesting proteins. And, and many of these proteins have bizarre structures uh, sticking out of them like antennas. Some of these are used to receive other molecules. They will attach themselves to these carbohydrates. Some of them are simply used to identify who we are. So, for example, all the cells in our body uh, somehow have similar proteins on them and that's so that our body knows who it is. And any foreigner that didn't have that same pattern on their cells, our body would recognize that as an enemy and probably try to destroy it. Inside, on the undersurface, we see an awful lot of these filaments that we talked about in the plant and the animal cell running underneath the membrane, sort of holding things together, connecting to these proteins. And this is what gives the membrane some strength, because by itself, it's, it's pretty loose and floppy. But things like these proteins and these filaments give the membrane its, its, its shape and try to hold it together.